I once thought it was God. We were made in the image of God. And I now know through real research, through studying this, God is made in the image of man in our perceptions, in our experience. And it was the best hypothesis in the ancient world to understanding the world because of these experiences. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to Ramacro. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to the channel a fellow YouTube content creator who also dabbles in religion and specifically Christianity and the Bible. Welcome, Derek Lambert. Hey, how's it going, Lloyd? Thanks it's for going, inviting me. It's going really well. You have an amazing channel called Myth Vision. Um, maybe you can just show us the T-shirt uh, a little bit more. There we go, Myth Vision. And <laughs> you deal almost exclusively with uh, the Bible and Bible scholarship. Would that be correct? I would say for the most part, yeah. I do ex cult stuff, as you know, JW's fit in the Bible, but um, I do Scientology stuff as well, history. We're actually going beyond just the Bible now. We're dealing with the Greek world, the mythologies of that. We're dealing with Egyptian mythologies. Eventually, I hope to tack off like Hindu mythology. You name it. If it's mythology, I mean, we are myth. Klingon vision. mythology, Sith, you know, you name it. I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if there's a mythology out there, it sounds like you've got it covered. Right. Yeah. I'm working on it. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, that's wonderful. And and to be honest, um, you know, the videos that you've made on specifically the Bible, because that's obviously, you know, the the sacred text, quote unquote, that I'm uh, most interested in. Um, right. Some of the videos you've made on that and, and the scholars that you've had on, um, I, I found very, very informative. And I think you do very, very valuable work in this space. So Please, please do keep it up. I'll just get that out right at the beginning. I'll, I'll get the fanboying out out of the way, kind of quickly. So, well, I'm a fanboy of you as well, and what you've done is remarkable. And I hope that more people continue to leave uh, high control groups. I think you and me share a lot in common, Lloyd. We don't believe, but we also aren't here to make everyone like us. Um, you can believe what you want at the end of the day. Is what you're believing harming people? Is it actually causing negative in the world around us? And I think you and me share that, I suspect. I don't want to speak for you, but I think that after listening to you long enough, you care. Even yeah. whatever they believe, you care. It's just, if you're in a high control group, like we want you to get out of that. We want that to change. Yeah, um, and... Look, my my philosophy, and, and it has sort of shifted a little bit because uh, I've been doing this for over 11 years now. Um, you know, my philosophy is that I, d I don't lose sleep over what the individual beliefs of my audience are, you know. Um, w whether people choose to leave religion, whether people choose to um, change their religion or even remain, let's say, as Jehovah's Witnesses, I think the important thing uh, for both of us is that we we make resources available mm -hmm. um whether it's um material directly refuting you know cult propaganda in my case um or in your case um scholarly material uh you know drilling down to the origins of sacred texts and and what they mean and uh, how they arrived with us today so you know, just making resources available and and leaving it to our audience to make their own informed decisions, I think, is, is what it's about for me. I think so. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. So but what I wanted to do is especially um, in this conversation is kind of sort of talk content creator to content creator, um, because, you know, you have a deconversion story and, you know, it could be that your viewers are, are fairly familiar with it, but my viewers obviously aren't. And I'm interested, especially in what causes someone to leave cherished beliefs behind. Um, so maybe you could take us back to how you, you know, developed an interest in religion to begin with. I was born into a household where my father was Roman Catholic by tradition, not a devout Catholic. My mother was Pentecostal growing up. She had the Holy Spirit kind of uh, that kind of mentality, but 
she took me and my brother to church occasionally while my dad was off either in war or what we would call downrange, which was always in South America since he was in seventh group. And we would go to church. Mom would bribe us with an all you can eat buffet. I, I mean, this is literally my rec- recollection. And I'd be bored out of my mind sitting in the pupil, go to sleep on mom's lap. Occasionally we'd go to the kids area and then play games outside. The best part was we played games. Occasionally you hear a story about a man with a boat with a bunch of animals or stuff like that. But I guess subconsciously or even consciously in some way as a youth, without my memory reminding me that much, there was some impact with these stories that were there. I enjoyed them or liked them, but I'd fall asleep when the guy was standing behind that pulpit doing whatever that thing he was doing with the book open. Um, Eventually, what ended up happening, I think, is through the trauma of an alcoholic father and you grow up, right? So existential reality, you want to know like, what is, what's this all about? And you're going through life crisis. My father being an alcoholic and my mom would, you know, they had struggles. It was verbal abuse. Mostly occasionally it would get violent um, very rarely, but when it did, it, it was ugly. And me and my brother had to go through this. So I'm, I'm skipping a while to say that I'm sure all the building blocks, all the Legos were there to build the tower, However, it was when I was in sixth grade in a private school, because where we were at, there was a lot of violence, even in the schools and stuff. My mom didn't want me to go through that. So she put me in a private school. Uh, It was in North Carolina and uh, Cornerstone Christian Academy. You can literally Google it, find the, the school if anyone really wants to dig. I heard a sermon at the school because they had like everybody went into the area where they gave sermons. And the message was there is a heavenly father and this heavenly father loves you unconditionally and will never let you down. The biggest hero in my life, even in my senior project years after this experience was my father, my actual father who had many flaws, but he was almost invincible to me. He's always been my hero, even through those flaws This father that they had pitched to me as a young kid was greater than this hero in my life. And this father would never let me down, never forsake me. And that day they told me, they got me hooked with a guilty conscience by saying, if you've told one lie, you had to lie about that lie to cover that lie. So therefore you lied again. And they like had rubber bands as their image. I don't even remember how it went. It, It made me feel guilt, but don't worry this heavenly father who would never let you down sent his son to take that away forever through his blood. It didn't need to actually be logical. It didn't need to be scientific. I'm six, sixth grade. Like it just needed to hit me with this message of in my gut of like, you're guilty, but don't worry. You can be forgiven. Accept the Lord in your heart today. And I went down and I did, and I felt a warm bosom experience where I had a comforter The Holy Spirit had entered me and I had felt like this was it. This was, this was it. I am, I found my father in heaven. So I had this kind of internal talk that I had from that moment, that moment forward. And so that's where we began. That's really where I remember consciously making a decision and going down in front of an audience, in front of a public audience and accepting Jesus into my life. With a warm bosom experience. Oh, the whole um, day, the whole day, Lloyd. Yeah, it was overwhelming. Yes. Yeah, I, I'd want that to be prolonged. Um, but no, seriously, it, it it sounds like you had like a really profound experience, and uh, straight away, I'm thinking about my conversations with, you know, with people from other religions. Like, for example, maybe you know that I I studied with some Mormons for. A, for mm. two or three months and you know they're, they're coming at you with lots of emotional reasoning as to as to why you know they've had being like personal uh testimony or, or personal experience that their faith is true and what you're saying now sounds every bit as compelling almost as though you still believe now that it was actually kind of jesus reaching out to you and and drawing drawing you towards him i'll say it this way as darren brown the mentalist has said when he converted an atheist on one of his shows he converted Mm -hmm. an atheist and darren brown is an atheist the experience i felt and what they did was real 
Darren Brown, when you watch the video, if you haven't seen it on YouTube, takes a woman who's an atheist, particularly singles her out because she was more skeptical than the other ones that were saying they don't believe in God. And he chose her because he said, I'm going to convert her in 15 minutes. He took real things in her life. Her father, go watch the episode, who's a hero in her life, using that as the catapult to a much bigger father who really cares about us all. It was just a leap of agency from my father to this father in heaven. The experiences that that pastor that day tapped into were real for me. But it's only one little step to get people believing that this is magical, that this is divine, that there really is this thing that's doing it. And so it's really something we all have within. And so, yes, the experience I had was real. The experience I have was based off real things, but it's easy to just take that small little leap and make agency something beyond the real experiences we have in our actual lives. And so, yes, I still say the experience was real. And I've had that experience hundreds of times. And even now I have these experiences, but I'm no longer a believer. Wow. Okay. In what way do you still have these experiences? I'll hear a song. And the song is about my love for my wife or my kids Mm. or or even something self-building, something to do better. How can I help that hurting person who struggles with addiction or that person like I watched yesterday? Me and my wife, we cried just watching a short on YouTube. There was a girl who was getting her hair cut. All it took was a little bit of background music, her hair to, to being bald. And the barber was cutting her hair and she's starting to ball her eyes out. Then out of nowhere, after he took her hair off, He took the blade to his own head. I think I've seen that video as well. I get goosebumps talking about it right now. Is that the Holy Spirit? Oh my gosh. Is that the Holy Spirit? No, that is intrinsically the human experience. Mm. See, God is the perception of man in my mind today. I once thought it was God. We were made in the image of God. And I now know through real research, through studying this, God is made in the image of man in our perceptions and our experience. And it was the best hypothesis in the ancient world to understanding the world because of these experiences. Now we have better evidence. We have better reasons to say that's not the case. So we cried last night watching that video because something deep about connecting and uniting, we evolved this way with another human being, helping another human being that There's some message there, right? You see it in the gospels. You see it in the letters of the epistles. Feed the poor, help the widow. I mean, why is that good? It's intrinsically good. And Christianity didn't come and bring that. This was something that we humans have developed over time and realized about ourselves. And so, sorry, I'm getting already in the weeds here, but I think it's important to point out that Christians have that experience, but Christians almost sometimes think, Well, we capitalize on that. That's why some Christians who find out that others have experiences, they don't want to say, oh, that experience isn't real. They want to give it to the devil or Satan or to the flesh. And they want to like delegitimize the experience of others. No, Mm. I think we all have them. There's a reason. And I think naturalism best explains that. So uh, it's safe to say that, you know, your, your background and my say even suggest your, the geography of where you were raised, you know, had a big hand in, I mean, if you'd been raised in um, Pakistan or, or Japan, you know, um, it's possible you could have had an experience with another religion, but you know, the part of the world where you were growing up, um, I would suggest greatly influenced which religion it was that was able to induce that experience in you. Mm -hmm. And, it's also fair to say, isn't it, that when when you're surrounded with people who are having similar experiences or validating your experience, almost this kind of herd mentality kicks in where you know you're 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 doing something together and you're pursuing uh, a belief system together. Would that be fair? I think that's one hundred percent fair, and I would mm. say it's it's no coincidence that I became extremely devout as a Christian. And as a child, I was raised going into these churches. So I think that it's no coincidence that I drew this conclusion and found that Christianity was the truth. See, Lloyd, I wasn't just a Christian. I literally was on my way to becoming an apologist for Christianity. I was, this is down the road, of course, but I I ended up going to college 
and really was going to become a pastor and then started doing apologetics because I'd already been investigating apologetics. I spent thousands of dollars on Ravi Zacharias material and William Lane Craig material. And I was diving deep into this Lee Strobel, all of them. I'd been reading their books, listening to their videos, watching their videos, going to the, I worked at the Christian, Christian bookstore for a while. I was really into that. If I, I, to phrase it another way, Lloyd, if I wasn't born into a house with two Christian parents who at least identified in the culture of Christianity and wasn't brought to the churches, I don't know if I would have become a Christian. That's my point. Yeah. Wow. So from, from your kind of epiphany um, that day in, in church to when you kind of mentally separated from your belief, your belief system, how many, how many years are we talking about? Probably 11 or 12, maybe, right. maybe 13, something like that. Um, okay. I would say it was, it was well over a decade. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what was it? Cause going straight into apologetics is, is pretty intense. So you, you were, you were setting out to save people to, to Jesus, one would assume. And, and you saw, you saw kind of atheism as, maybe a foe to be defeated was that where you were coming from atheism wasn't even on my radar much right. it 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 was really like uh i guess it may have been subconsciously i don't really remember it being like oh but i would watch richard dawkins or some of these debates and i hated them like i really did not like these people i would use the word extremely disliked these atheists that would argue with whether it be um john um the mathematician john I, I can't remember mean. his name. Yeah, so I know who you mean, yeah. Mathematician, Wayne Lane. Can you put his name on the screen, please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ravi yeah. Zacharias, you name it, like yeah. all of these different people who well, Ravi didn't really do debates, but I would watch them and I'd almost want to skip the atheist part to hear how the Christian beat up the other guy. Um, I didn't really enjoy listening to people who weren't crediting God. But it was really, I think, in high school when I would hear people, I brought my Bible to lunch. I hear people go, why don't you wait till you're old and ready to die to like give your life to God and like read the book? Enjoy yourself while you're young. I'm a young kid in a public high school with my King James Bible, reading my Bible at lunch, eating lunch. So I stuck out like a sore thumb. I mean, nobody else was doing this. And those people who would doubt, I would go to church and while worshiping, sometimes go, are you real God? Show me a sign. And I do it for like 15 minutes during our worship service, which we would get like really into the worship. It was like charismatic. And then I'd go, forgive me, God, for, for doubting that you exist. Cause I would sincerely wonder, can you show me, just prove to me and that's enough. And I'll live the rest of my, my days out. Like really. And one time I thought one sign was legit. I asked and begged God during, a, a, a during a time of being in worship and a couple of weeks before that, my dad and I were arguing because he was going down to not Venezuela, but it was Colombia, which is extremely dangerous in South America. And I cried to him and said, Dad, if you don't accept Jesus in your heart as Lord and Savior, you don't follow Christ, you're going to go to hell if you die down there in combat. And I need to know that you've you've accepted the Lord. I'll be able to sleep at night. And he snapped on me. Get the F out of my face. I mean, like the whole nine, right? And he was so angered. And I just went inside and cried. Mom went. You planted the seed, honey. You planted the seed. Weeks later, I'm at church. It might have been weeks later. It might have been that week. I can't remember the chronology. I begged for a sign. And my dad showed up at our church. Uh, 15, 20 minutes after the worship service started, the door, because it's a house church, there was a knock on the door. And I went, and there's dad. And I just started crying. And I was like, this is proof. Because the whole time I'm asking for a sign, get, flick the light, have a lawnmower blade, spin a rock into the window. Like, I don't care anything. Prove you're here. Nothing happens. So I'm like, forgive me for doubting. And then boom, dad shows up. And it's like, there's your evidence. So that mm. motivated me to keep going and going and going. And then life hits, struggles happen. And it's it's not as easy. I, I, I was addicted to drugs at a young age. And that's a whole nother part of my journey. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I, I, and I, I've, I heard about that already. And I think anyone who is able to overcome addiction uh 
you know, deserves a medal, you know, because it's uh, a huge mountain to climb. Um, but just for the benefits of my viewers who are ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and who aren't maybe familiar with kind of what you're describing, you, you describe charismatic worship. Can you can you kind of describe what that looked like at its most, yes. quote unquote, charismatic? Usually the way it would go is you go in and you'd listen to praise music. It has an uplifting experience to it. it it's more mm. positive, like, yes, Lord, you know, and you get hype, right? So they would like have tambourines or you clap your hands. And then the the songs which you're giving these honors that you would give to someone that you really, really appreciate, a king, a queen, your parents, something like that, if you really were giving them honors. Um, and you're you're giving God praise with some uplifting music, and then the music shifts, and then the music becomes, um, you know, Lord, we love you, something that's really uh, heartfelt, emotional, and it so it goes from kind of people. frantic and kind of building up your emotions to kind of being very um, kind of. How can I put it? Powerful. It's more soft, powerful, deep yeah. emotion, almost like love music that you yeah. would you would get really quiet and you'd really a bit more be like, like Celine Dion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or something that I wouldn't want yeah. to play for monetization reasons, but it's like yeah. it's out there. You can go and yeah. listen to Hill song, right? You can find a song where it it touches you and you're mm. deep in you're deep in trance and thought. And yeah. it's not this anymore. It's it's people who are going, Yes, Lord. Mm. Yes, Lord, praise your name, like that kind of thing. And the next thing you know, um, you get into service after you're done going through a what I would say a chemical rush of various uh, <laughs> chemicals in the brain that just prepares you for the message. And next thing you know, you're hearing from God's word and you're diving into the story or the message of the day, whatever the pastor has. And that was kind of how it went with almost all of them, whether it was Calvary Chapel that I went to, I had been to Presbyterian church, which that's a different, they were so old school and so dry that they were reading from hymns from the 1700s. It was really like, what the heck? They weren't up to date. So I hated the worship there. It was not fun. But there was charismatic or non-denominational type churches that really get into this. And I think all of them kind of do something to that effect. By the time it's slow and soft, the pastor could come in and do something like this. Someone in here struggling in their marriage. You know who you are. And you love each other so much. But the life, the struggle of the flesh and the struggle of finances. And like, I'm going, how does he know? You know, like, like, and you believe it's you. That's you're, so you're, specific. It's yeah. so like, nobody could ever <laughs> guess that people are struggling in their marriage. Yeah, Are you yeah. kidding me? Like yeah. everyone struggles. I mean, yeah. mostly with their yeah. marriage. I, for sure. I'm 16 years. How the hell, excuse my French. Mm. Are we still together? Like, like mm. it, it's mind boggling, but we worked at it. So he hit me with those messages and then I'd go down to the altar and get prayed over again and be saved again. Sometimes, sometimes I was already saved and sometimes you had to get recommitted, rededicate. And that was life as a Christian. Wow. Did you, did you get baptized by the way? Oh yeah. At the house church, I've been baptized. I was baptized in the Presbyterian church. I've been baptized at other churches so, so you've been baptized multiple times because I noticed you got baptized in, in Israel recently as well. Oh, Can't keep you out of the water, can we? We can't. That was a myth vision <laughs> baptism. So uh, I've been immersed. So certain traditions have you go underwater. And right. in the Presbyterian church, they sprinkle. So I was baptized by them where they sprinkled. Um, and then, of course, in the Jordan River, me and my wife baptized ourselves. Uh, I baptized her. She baptized me. For fun, okay. in the name of myth fishing, of course. Sure, sure. So it sounds very well. What you've described is very interesting because, although on the one hand it's far removed from um, Jehovah's Witness meetings, which I think you would call dry. Um, you know, you're you just all basically sat there um, listening to talks, listening to sermons. Um, nowadays, 
um, it's punctuated by videos. So they'll have actual monitors up on the walls and you'll watch a clip from JW Broadcasting or, or a specific interview or, or whatever. But it's mostly like just a series of either talks or demonstrations of, of how you might convert someone in the preaching work mm. um, or maybe a little bit of audience participation where they're going through particular material and they're asking questions and people put their hands up and they have to obviously give the correct answers. Um, it sounds completely different in that regard. However, when you describe the use of music as an emotionally, let's just say an emotionally manipulative tool to get you into a frenzy so that you're effectively bypassing logic um, that's definitely used by Jehovah's Witnesses in their video propaganda. So it's interesting to see that commonality. Yeah, even in the Presbyterian, which was dry, the message still would hit. So mm. even without the music uh, in cases, the message still got through. It just helped the delivery, right? If you had the music help, it helps. You don't need it. But it really helps if you have that, because people who come to me and go, oh, when we worship, we don't have all that you know, music. We don't need all of that fancy schmancy. We have just the gospel, and that's enough to do the, the, the deed. I think I'm recalled when Paul says, I did not come to you with lofty wisdom and, and, and like almost like he's saying, I didn't come to you with educated words and philosophy. I came to you with the gospel, which is foolishness to the world. But um, I think the point is, is what what's going on there when i'm reading into paul's he he went into the deep psyche and the emotion of a person so they're not just going to find another message or another philosophy coming it's just going to grab them they're struck in a subconscious way where i don't think they could just let go that easily i've seen that happen with christians all the time and a lot of them that i've engaged with apologists since leaving christianity want to try and some of them want to go, I never had this experience you're describing, and I never had any of that. I just read the New Testament and was convinced by reading the New Testament, and that's why I'm a Christian. If you watch enough Myth Vision of all of the Ivy League academics and serious scholars I have on my channel, you you really have to question, like, how much does this person really know? And how far have they really read to then read the New Testament and act like that was enough? You can go read Suetonius. You're not going to think that a snake rode up to Suetonius's mother and impregnated her. You're mm -hmm. not going to read about the portents of his birth and his divine status and think this is really true about Caesar Augustus, Octavian. But if you've read that and you, you're convinced by just reading that without any experience, I have to question other things about that person because I just don't know if I can – I don't know if that's honest or what it is. I don't know what to make of it. I can remember um, before going to this uh, special ministerial training school uh, class that, that we had as Jehovah's Witnesses. They now call it something different. They call it the School for Kingdom Evangelizers. But essentially, it was a two-month course um, for young Jehovah's Witness, well, not just young, but Jehovah's Witness men to essentially drill them in um, what was required for them to be of use to the organization. And I remember before attending the course, they had us read through the New Testament uh, beginning to end. Um, just to kind of, I mean, we were supposed to have done that anyway, um, but they had us specifically do it before we attended. And, you know, when you're reading it in that way, in, the, in like a very linear way, um, you know, what's not to make sense? You know, it, it, it's only really when you kind of, put the gospels kind of side by side and notice the contradictions. And when you start to apply skepticism to stuff like Romans nine, where it's talking about predestination, uh, it's only then that it starts to unravel. But if you're just going to read it in a very linear way from the point of view of someone who, who needs it to be true, mm -hmm. um, of course, it's going to make total sense to you. I think that, yeah, you could walk away reading the Gospels and be moved by the mm. message of the author. The author is trying to convince you. They literally tell you that multiple times. Let the reader understand. Like they're wanting you to believe. Mm. Um, at the end of the day, though, if you're approaching it and all you have is just you're just reading the Bible, 
I cannot relate to, oh, you just read this and it was convincing because these aren't people who are just saying that they're convinced by just reading the gospel. These are people who are acting like you all it takes is just reading the gospels and you know that this happened historically. Almost like if you don't believe after reading this, your intelligence is low or you don't, you're not smart. Or the other way is though that I hear a lot of apologists argue is you just want to be your own God. So you don't, mm. you want to live your own life. You want to live in sin. And therefore almost like they don't do things like they are not sinners and doing things like it's really odd to me because this brings up a personal thing during my Christian life. We had a place called Trojans for Christ. And that was our icon at public school. Somehow the public school allowed this Christian group in the gymnasium each morning and they would call people down and we'd have like a charismatic meet at the public school where Christians could go and get prayed over and whatnot. I'd almost go down there every other day to have them pray for the spirit of lust because we believed it was a spirit because I would watch pornography. I'm a young kid, right? And going through puberty, that was just something my whole young into my adult life that I had as a struggle. And I'd go down there and get prayed for. And I look back and realize None of the youth leaders ever went through that. None of them were getting prayed for for this. Like they were all just praying for other people. And it was like, am I being too honest? My dad's told me this my whole life. Don't tell your wife everything, son, because you tell her everything. You're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Just, just work it out between you and God, that kind of thing. But I would really sincerely want to try and fix this problem that I saw was evil in my mind because I was taught this. And, um, I didn't notice that they did that. So I don't know. I mean, it's it's a really, there's a lot of layers to this onion that play a part in my mm. own experience, but you kind of wonder, am I being more honest than other people are about this? And that's why I end up be converting. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I think probably they they were looking at porn too, but weren't being quite as serious about you know, combating it as you evidently were. Um, in terms it, it, of, it made me obsess yeah. even more about it. By the way, that was a harmful mm. thing because it's like don't eat the cookie. That warm chocolate milk, nice cookie over there on the table. It's bad for you. Don't you dare eat that. <sighs> the cookie and like. They're acting like this is this. Why are you down here after 48 hours? Why are you mm. coming back being prayed for? All right, let's pray for Derek again. And it just became almost like habitual. Yeah. And I didn't understand. Like, I didn't understand. Am I and just... it's, it's humiliating as well, isn't it? It it's, is. It's humiliating to have other people um, intervene or in any way insert themselves in your personal sex life. Or, exactly. Um, and it's almost like the... It's almost like, um, what's the word? Uh, it, it perpetuates. So the, the more you humili humiliate yourself, the more you, the, 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 the lower down you, you feel you need to go in the future. It's, it, there's, there's no kind of coming back from it. So right. I definitely relate to that because obviously there's a lot of sexual repression in Jehovah's Witnesses as well. So I'm, I'm just in, interested as well in, because uh, you mentioned that you went to college and you started down the, you almost kind of bypassed becoming a pastor to become a, a Christian apologist. So um, what kind of prompted you in that direction and, and how did you, what led to you abandoning that project? So I think I would rephrase how you put that. Okay. I was at a, Calvary Chapel Church, listening to the pastor give a sermon on how Jesus says, tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And he did it off the cuff, not hoping he didn't have his Bible open. He's being poetic and engaging and it, 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 powerful. And he says, and then the Jews said, we built this temple in, he said, 40 years. But the text I knew by heart from studying this was 46. So I knew that he made an error on how many years they said it took for them to build. It was 46 years, not 40 so once I saw that, I was like, okay, hold on. He made a mistake. And it, it ate at me. It ate at me that he made a textual error, not knowing it off the top of his mind. And I and something made me go, do you, do you know this material better than this guy who's teaching you about the material? It made me wonder, Derek, maybe your calling is to teach because you really want to get it right. 
you want to you want to know what the word of god teaches and says and you don't want to play around why don't you become a pastor so i approached him after the sermon never mentioning his error there of course that was in my head i remember but i asked him how do i become what you are and become a pastor and be able to lead a flock and teach people about god's word because i love god's word so he said go down here to the local college carolina bible college of biblical studies and I did. I, I I went. I had to get a grant from the government. FAFSA is what it's called here. And I went and I started going to this college to learn more about the Bible and to pretty much become a pastor. While learning about the Bible and going to college, I was also learning by listening to people defending the faith. Ravi Zacharias, William Lane Craig, you name it, like these main pop apologists that were out there defending the faith and books that go out of their way to say, we have justified reasons, we have evidence, the science is on our side, the clues are there, like all of this stuff to try and prove my Christianity was true and to help others convince them that it's like the truth and it's evidence-based. And uh, I got into presuppositional apologetics, I got into evidential apologetics, but along that way of going to that college, I heard about that pastor that I had been influenced to go to the college, and he had been sleeping with multiple women members of that church and got caught by his wife um, doing this. And I knew my own natural inclinations as a human and my experience, as I've mentioned, with pornography and stuff, that is this the wisest move? Now, that wasn't what drew me out of it. I still was going to, but this was something in my thoughts along the way is like, if I get into a place of power, power absolutely corrupts absolutely. Am I going to end up in this place where I'm now having these married women in the church or single women in the church I'm having to counsel or there's somehow where I end up in a hiccup and I fall big time because of this? It was in the back of my head, being honest. The other problem was I have an addiction issue and I had a tooth extract. I had all my wisdom teeth actually extracted while I went to college. I was going through, I had my associate's degree at the time. They pulled my teeth out and they prescribed me uh, opioids and I ended up relapsing and I ended up going down hard. We relocated. I was working for T-Mobile. I moved. I wasn't going back to the college and I kind of got away from both that college where one of the professors was my pastor of the church, Andy Webb, who's a Presbyterian PCA member on the very strict conservative end because there's debates among PCA. PCA. These guys see themselves as descendants of the Puritans. They're within the Puritan line. Very strict. They showed up at my house on Sundays and said, like, you broke Sabbath because Sunday to them is Sabbath. And they would like literally say that's a sin, that kind of level of control. Uh, they wanted my wife to quit her job so that I could get a job that would provide. And in the meantime, they would cover all our bills so that they would have her be at home and stop working because the woman is supposed to stay at home and be the mom and caretake for the husband and the kids. Like it was very high in control. All of this is kind of going on at the same time. When we moved and I had relapsed, we stopped going to that church. My wife got a excommunication letter in the mail because they already and I thought they weren't, she wasn't really regenerate. She may not have been really saved. She didn't take it serious. So we all wondered if she was even a real believer. And my wife would be hurt by that because she always felt that she was a true believer. Funny thing is, I no longer believe my wife still thinks there's a higher power of some sort out there. She always has. So, like, it's really interesting. She's and been you consistent. didn't get the excommunication letter. She did not till a year after that. Oh, right. Okay. So they finally lay the hammer down on me and excommunicated me from that. I was still a Christian when this happened, but I had. What made me get also excommunicated? There's layers to this onion, Lloyd. I started to get deep into. I'm going to peel those layers off, Derek. Peel them off. I'm going to peel them. <laughs> <laughs> I started taking serious the end times. Now I already thought seriously about them, but I thought it was like the rapture's coming soon. Jesus is coming back. I really had dreams about this. One of the dreams: fire from the sky. The whole sky was covered in fire. I was a young kid. And then all of a sudden the flames came down on that side and came at me and I closed my eyes and I was warm, that warm feeling I felt in church that day. And there was like a womb, like a child inside its mother's womb is the kind of analogy I'd paint. And there was this man with a feathered pen who said, Derek, everything's going to be okay now. 
he whispered with a still small voice. And then another one I had, I was on a front porch and a lightning storm was going and I was watching and then the bolt struck me. Now I'm getting sucked into heaven. And while I'm getting sucked up, I'm looking around and there's all these people connected to lightning bolts and they're all going up into heaven. It was the rapture in my head. I woke up. I cried when I woke up from both of them. I say that to say I was serious about the second coming, but I didn't study the second coming any critical way of analyzing other Christian views. Only within Christianity's views was I willing to explore, of course. So if it's kosher, I'll taste it. And I, I started looking at eschatology at the Presbyterian Church, and they said, check out amillennialism. Um, and then I started looking at R.C. Sproul after I became an amillennialist, reading a book called The Case for Amillennialism by an, a lady named Kim something. She makes a case. Became a post-millennial partial preterist after listening to R.C. Sproul, Kenneth Gentry, Gary DeMar. Some of these guys were reformed like I was, meaning Calvinist, Presbyterian type. And I started going, hold on, some of the stuff that's talked about in the Gospels where Jesus talks about some of these things will, these signs, they're going to happen. All of this is supposed to happen before this generation passes mm. away. Um, and of course I said, that's 70 AD. So I started yeah. realizing it's talking about the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. My exploration into partial preterism for about a year and a half, two years led me into a heresy according to the church. And it is heretical according to orthodoxy and it's called full preterism. That is all Bible prophecy is fulfilled. And the reason you would come to this kind of conclusion is because Jesus in the gospels says certain things. And if you read what he says, what he says is pretty clear. If what he says did not happen then, back then, then he failed. Yeah. I am so serious. Doesn't C.S. About the Lewis say something similar? Yep. That he'd be a, a complete um, fraudster if he wasn't talking about the events of the first century. Yeah. Yes. And mm. so I realized he includes the final destruction and judgment he includes the resurrection of the dead he like jesus in the gospels is portrayed as saying this now mm -hmm. what the real historical jesus said that's a whole different deep dive into critical scholarship on knowing what did he say did he say any of the things the gospels are saying that's mm -hmm. where i'm at now but that's a whole wow I mean, to get to that point, we're not even beginning there. I'm still a Christian who says the Gospels are saying what Jesus really said. So if he said these things, I have to believe them because God's word is true. That was my presupposition. So Jesus promised some stuff. And I said, you know what? I have to believe it. It's true. Jesus' second coming happened in 70 AD. The final resurrection happened. I don't know exactly how it happened. Christians that were in the Prater circles debated it. They didn't know if it was some esoteric, allegorical, spiritual thing. Some thought that it happened at a certain time after 70 AD in the mountains when he said, flee to the mountains. Well, at that point, he like raptured the church at that time. Like we, we tried to save the savior over and over, Lloyd. And I really was finding out the Christian church has just got Jesus wrong. So I was brought into that Presbyterian church before I was uncomfortable and wanted to get away and relocate five elders in that church sat me down and said Shh, don't speak and i sat and i listened and i wanted to like martin luther did the reformer the protestant who said scripture and god's word my conscience it just i cannot deny the words that i'm reading and they wanted me to shut up. This is heresy. Stop talking about it. So I felt in a way, not on the level of death threats that Martin Luther had, but like Martin Luther here, trying to stand up for God's word and make sure that the Savior is saved. Because I knew what they were concluding meant that they were missing out that Jesus failed. And so I had to believe it. And I was a, I went to New York. I gave a sermon at Michael Miano, who's still a full preterist pastor today. Uh, Blue Point Bible Church on Long Island, New York, went and gave sermons and teachings and did online podcasts and all of that. And then stuff happens. And if you're ready for that, I'll give it to you. <laughs> well, that's that's why I'm here. That's what I want to because right? it sounds like you you properly, properly went into it. And um yeah, I I, I wow, I, I I want to know how this <laughs> 
So yeah, come on, hit me with it. Look, I'm going to tell you, Lloyd, I'm skipping so many things along I know. this way. I'm sure you purpose. are. I'm sure you are. Yeah. I have to, for the sake of your audience, because they mm. are going to watch this and go, what else? And there's so much, but we don't have that kind of time, right? So yeah, I, I, I'm deep into scripture. I then know that the end has to be first century. The, the book of Revelation, when it talks about no more tears, that is metaphorical, our interpretation uh, of the law. The law brought death. The law brought this agony, but Jesus came and put an end to that. We're in the new heavens and new earth. I had We had found a way to say that new heavens and new earth literally came, but it never was literal heavens and literal earth. So we had reinterpretations. I call this cognitive dissonance, and, and I'm sure many other people oh, do. Oh, it is, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but there's it's, a funny it's, way. It's, it's, and it's it's being very um, selective in which scriptures we take as literal and which scriptures we take as metaphor, isn't it? Yes, it is. Mm. And so I ended up like going back to Genesis. And in fact, there's a book on my shelf here, uh, right here. I'll grab it. Yeah. This book right here, Beyond Creation Science, is actually a full preterist book that tries to renegotiate what's going on in Genesis based on fulfilled eschatology. Preterist, full preterism, P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-M. And so in this book, you come to find out that, holy smokes, Genesis is prophesying. Um, it's a prophecy book, according to their interpretation. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed, your seed and her seed and all that stuff. Yeah. All of that. But they had to renegotiate things like animals. When you read about animals being created, they're actually humans, different nations, so they don't even take it literal as animals. You start going so far that I can find somewhere in the Hebrew Bible that sounds like the nations are these wild animals. Look at the book of Daniel and the lion and then and then the, the, the eagle and stuff. Um, all of that like starts to factor in to how we're looking at the text. Sounds like want. a bad trip, this. <laughs> It does, yeah. but we're yeah. trying, we're, we're really getting deep into yeah. this. And the hermeneutic we're using is the Bible interpreting the Bible method. And long story short, to put it simply, I started to see a pattern between Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha, Jesus or John the Baptist and Jesus, or you could even say Jesus and the church. So either way, I found this pattern and that pattern was this. In Moses' story, there's always these twos that kind of come. Even Jews have like two messiahs. One will be the priest and one will be like the king, the, the militant one. Um, but in Moses, there's in the passages of Exodus, 72 elders, 70 and then two were in the village. But either way, 72 in Elijah and Elisha, 72 that watch and see Elijah get raptured up by a chariot of fire with, with Elisha getting his mantle. Then you go to the New Testament. You find in Luke, he talks about he sends them out two by two, 72, right? So I started finding numbers and patterns because we're pattern-seeking creatures. And I realized, oh my gosh, cloud by day, fire by night. Remember when he says the cloud by day will follow you or help you lead you out of the into the promised land? The fire by night, there's a pillar of fire. You find this in Elijah and Elisha's story as well. Well, wouldn't you know it? You start seeing passages of um, the disciples saying, should I call down fire from heaven? Like, you, you start seeing these patterns, and there's literally 40, 50 patterns that I started seeing. And, and in my head as a Christian, I said, holy smokes, maybe this is the thumbprint of God repeating in history, that term, history. And then I mowed on it for a while and came across a guy who was an atheist. I did not know he was an atheist who was into full preterism like me, but he had no longer believed. Hmm. He contacted me in Messenger on Facebook and said, can we talk? I just want to share with you some cool stuff. Sure, let's talk. Remember, I think this is literal history, and I think these patterns are real, and God's thumbprint of proving who he is. The guy gets on the phone with me, and he's like, I want to compare some stuff with you. And my gut told me something's up. Like, this guy, does he believe? So I had to ask him, are you an atheist? I'm not going to think of you differently, though, I promise. But in my mind, I'm thinking, if he's an atheist, you really <laughs> need to. Like, I'm not yeah. wanting him to know that I'm already going to be very careful about anything he tells me. He says, I'm not going to lie, Derek. I don't believe. But I don't want you not to believe. I want to share with you some cool stuff. Yeah. So he started comparing Hercules and Samson. He said, who's the strongest man who ever lived? I'm like, Samson. He goes, you want to know who the strongest man who ever lived to the Greeks was? And I was like, it's Hercules. And he goes, let me show you some comparisons between Hercules and Samson. 
that was the beginning, the very beginning of something that radically rocked my entire world. Because I always thought the Bible, its stories, and Jesus were unique, they're historical, and there's nothing else out there like this. That's when I went, oh, snap. And he gave me a whole new interpretation of the book, the story of Samson. He said, Samson's name means little son. He has seven locks on his head. There are seven days to the week. He said, when his hair gets cut off, when the rays of the sun get cut off, the sun loses its strength. And in the story of Samson, his hair finally, the third time, interesting threes play a role. Jonah gets swallowed by a well uh, and is in the belly of the well for three days. Jesus, three days. There's three days motifs all over the place. But here in Samson, his hair gets cut off and it's done by Delilah and she gets paid in silver. So you have sun, which would be gold. Usually it's kind of symbolized with gold. And then you have the moon that's symbolized with silver. And so the moon is in a love-hate relationship with the sun. You also find this in ancient Egypt as well. Like there's all sorts of mythology that goes back. So I started reading this and going, what? And he's grinding mill blind after they gouge his eyes out, literally with a fiery rod that's been burnt, like sear his eyes out of his sockets. Then the day comes, they're celebrating the god Dagon. And they bring this prisoner of Israel out who killed so many Philistine and all of that. He comes out. He's between the two pillars. And he asks, can he rest against them? Sure. That moment, he asks God for the strength. And boom, pillars come down. 3,000 and something Dagon worshipers die that day. The point is, I saw that maybe there was some allegory about the sun, moon, and stars that is anthropomorphized into the narrative. It's complex. But it gave me a non-literal hermeneutic that let me go. Wow, maybe there's some depth to the stories. But then I saw that it could be it could be compared to other stories that were outside of mm. my sacred book. That radically changed my view about God and Jesus. And to give you in a nutshell, God got bigger for me. But the way I describe it is, you know, those little things, those little balls that kind of are they're like Lego looking balls that when you expand them. They 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 expand and contract and they're colorful. You know what I'm talking about? What what are those called? Colorful you know? balls. No. They they maybe expand. we don't have them here. Well, they expand. And, and I am contract. quite an authority on toys as a father of two young girls. So well, um, I'm using this as a for God, right? Like okay. God in Christianity was small, narrow path, very, very exclusive and powerful in my life. But when I saw that the narratives cross cultures, even into India and ancient mythologies, and I realized, oh my gosh, there is comparisons to these other stories. Even the Genesis flood myth comes from the older Mesopotamian mythology. Yeah. So I had to, I was forced to go, maybe God is working beyond the biblical Jewish Christian narrative in the world. And that's when I went, God's bigger. Maybe it's the six wise men of Hindustan narrative. You ever read that? No. Nope. There's six wise men of Hindustan to learning much inclined. They all went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind. And they all might, you know, by observation, satisfy their mind. They describe the elephant, all six wise men, and they describe them differently. One's a fan. One says he's like a wall. One says he's like a spear. They all walk away. And at the end, they're debating this elephant. And the, the end of the poem says, all of them are disputing and, and arguing about this elephant. Uh, and they're, they're doing it in their ween is the word they use as ween in this poem. And then it says about an elephant that none of them has seen. Hmm. So God is the elephant. And they're all describing the different cultures are trying to describe this thing, this, this being that they don't know what they're talking about. I started thinking like that. Maybe they're all touching the elephant somewhat, but they don't really know what it is. So I granted that maybe all faiths, all religions are kind of right in some way. Eventually, that strength, power, control of a God hovering over my every single action of what I did started to dissipate and disappear. The harm that came from fundamentalism in my belief, in my mind, started to disappear. Yeah. And that's when I saw God not so powerful and strong. It got bigger. God got bigger. But the strength and power that God had in my life. When you say bigger, do you mean like clearer or more clearly defined? 
when I say bigger, I mean the God described in the Bible is exclusively the God of Jewish Christian ideas. If you're not right. a Christian, you're not worshiping the true God. Mm. I'm saying that was baloney by this time. Mm. I'm saying Hindus, Muslims, Buddhist, you name it. It doesn't matter who they are. Native Americans, whoever you are, you're touching God. And God got so big, he popped the bubble of few find the path thereof and, and many, the broad to destruction path. Screw that. Yeah. No, the only way to the father is through the son, Jesus said. I was willing to go, sorry. Jesus at the time, that was good for the Jews and the few Christians at the time. That's fine. For that moment, for that place. Not for world's history, not forever. And that is how I started to accept it. God was bigger than Jesus. God was bigger than Moses. God was bigger than Abraham. God was bigger than Hinduism. God was bigger than Islam. I'm making a point. God got so big that its power over me, its control over me disappeared. Mm. That's when I started going after studying science. I then started wondering about evolution more. Because I had rejected that for young earth creationism and, and all the anti-science rhetoric that Christianity has brought into the picture, I started to investigate science better and realizing, even though I had flirted with old earth creationism while as a Christian, once I left and realized we did evolve, mm. like that's the most plausible evidence-based thing we have scientifically that we mm. evolved, it changed so much because then I started going, what if this is a human thing? What if mm. we, in our evolutionary process to survive, have come and comforted ourselves with certain things that we believe are true? So when it says we were made in God's image, what if God was made in ours, our perception of the world around us? Isn't it interesting that God looks like a human, talks and acts like a human? Xenophon, one of the ancient philosophers said that if horses could draw a picture of their God, it would have the head of a horse. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. So like you go and you start going, what is going on? You're you gotta spark like expand your mind. Don't stay in the box. And my life freedom, even while I was still kind of pantheistic or theistic, I say either or because I didn't know what I was, Lloyd. Mm. My the freedom that came with it, the joy. I didn't obsess over pornography anymore. I wasn't hurting myself. And during that process, I ended up recovering from drugs and alcohol. And I'm not going in depth into that story. I tell that sure. elsewhere. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad, isn't it interesting that you were able to do it finally without religion? Right. Now I'm seven years off heroin. Mm. I was injecting, I was injecting heroin in my veins. Some mm. of it was mixed with fentanyl at the time. Seven years ago, I got clean off drugs. And wow. I really think it's, I, it's a story itself, right? The way I paint it to you is I walked the hills of God and I searched the philosophies and I dug deep and I wanted to know, and all the hills had hard struggles going up, even going down. You got to take it easy, metaphorically speaking. Finally, I hit this hill and there was a mirror. And I looked in the mirror and it was me the whole damn time. Then when I saw that picture where it has Jesus carrying you and saw the two footprints, and when you were weak, it was I that carried you. I realized, no, it was us carrying ourselves the whole time. Mm. Like the life of Pi. You ever watch that movie? No. I won't, bro, I won't go there then. It's, it's deep, but it's really interesting. Mm. Um, that was my ex my story. Now I don't obsess. I don't go between, as I analogize it, between addicted to Jesus and addicted to drugs and alcohol because I was extreme in all. Now I found myself. Yeah. And I'm comfortable with my flaws. Totally comfortable with them. Wow. That that's an amazing journey. And so it's it's safe to say that you now identify as an atheist. Yes, without a doubt. And I mean, in the philosophical definition, because there's right. always a debate on there. Are you a lack theist? I do not believe that God or gods exist. Right. Would there be? Maybe. I do not believe that there, there are gods. And until that evidence comes to me, until mm. I have proof, I just, I don't believe unicorns or leprechauns or uh, fairies exist. I also don't believe that God or gods exist. Yeah. So 
I, I guess w- what interests me, because it, it's clear from what you've been describing that you have done a lot, and I mean a lot of research into religion. And, and this is where you and I differ, because, you know, when I was as Jehovah's Witness, we did not look into other religions and we did not interest ourselves in what other religions had to say. We had a book um, called Mankind's Search for God that was basically an an attempt at um, doing a whistle-stop tour of the world's religions and summing them all up as wrong. And we contented ourselves, well, hey, we don't need to even investigate what it says in the encyclopedia because, look, this book does it for us. So we, we... we had no interest in what actual Bible scholars had to say. We had no interest in investigating other worldviews, certainly not, you know, mythology and all that stuff. We 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 wanted, we we viewed ourselves as living in the last days and we we did not have time for that. So when I kind of crashed out of Jehovah's Witnesses, it was with no knowledge whatsoever of Bible scholarship. I'm only now kind of in the process of educating myself as to where the Bible really comes from. And and your channel is is enormously helpful in that regard. Um, So I I guess where I'm getting at is, what have you learned? um, How would you sum up uh, what you've learned about the Bible and its origins? And where do you stand on the historicity of Jesus? Do you have two hours? I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so, you know, I could go for that, but I'm, I'm I know, gonna, I know you could. Yeah. I'm trying to be poetic and, and yeah. swift. The Bible is loaded with legend, with mm. mythology, with some history. You mentioned earlier, we didn't bore ourselves with that mythology stuff. We we were biblical and we were apocalypticists and stuff. It's when I started realizing the Bible has mythology in it Mm. that really went, oh my gosh, where do I draw the line? How do I know what happened and what didn't happen? How do I know Mm. if that's mythology or if that's literal? Jonah swallowed by a well. I remember myself seven, 10 years ago, something like that. When I was a fundamentalist, I recorded myself. And if I could find the video, I would so put it online so I could roast myself. I said, if the word of God said that Jonah swallowed a well, I would believe it. That's what I used to say, because I believed the word of God was true and literal. Um, Maybe if course, it was a baby whale. <laughs> <laughs> right, like a little baby But whale. at least you didn't make a, a full HD dramatization of it happening, as Jehovah's Witnesses did uh, with that story, but go on. <laughs> yeah, but then I started like, fish in the belly of a whale for mm. three days, three nights? Come on. Uh, no, that's that's got to be a story, and it mm. is. So I started going stories. I love the stories of the Bible. Once I found out that the New Testament also has what we call legend, or I like to call myth, they're story making, meaning it probably didn't actually literally happen like we're seeing. Is there a kernel? This is the question. Is there history there? This is the question. And today, I'm not like I used to be. I'm right, and you're wrong in Mm. every respect. What I would say is... I am highly suspect of what is going on in the Gospels. John, Luke, Acts, Matthew, Mark, um, even in Paul's letters. So I'm wondering what is going on. I do think, to answer your question on a historical Jesus, I do think that there was a guy. I have studied Richard Carrier. I've studied Robert Price. I've studied all the mythicist scholars that are out there. Well, you've not just studied them. You've spoken to them. You've interviewed them on the channel, haven't you? Yes. So you've had some very in-depth conversations with people who really know their stuff on this particular subject. You've you've interviewed Bart and you've interviewed Richard Carrier. Both have polar opposite views on that. So I'm interested to know kind of where you're leaning at the moment. Yeah, I lean there's a guy. Um, Mm. I think he was crucified. I think that's a fact of history. However, beyond whatever comes after that, I would be really questionable about the mythicist historicist debate for me is not over the gospels. The gospels can be used. I just don't really rely on them to make my point. If I told you, Lloyd, 
This is how I'm going to paint. I want to interact with you for you to understand where I'm coming from. If I told you, man, that guy slam dunked, he crossed that guy, he juked him and he slammed in his face. He dunked in his face. What are you thinking of? Um, I, I don't really use that language as a Brit, but um, he, uh, gosh. If I said, hey. He, he, guy, he won an argument over him, I guess. He but. slam dunked. He dunked on him. He right. juked him. He, 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 right. Uh, what's some more basketball language to give you the imagery I'm trying to give? I mean, it's basketball, right? So I'm trying. Yeah, I don't to really this, follow basketball. Sorry. Right. This, I showed your, uh, your, you're not aware yeah. of basketball. But if I said that and I was mm. writing this letter to you and I mentioned, uh, you know, the guy dunked on so and so and, and they won in the, ba- in, in the game or whatever, you're going to think automatically. This is like NBA or some basketball game. You're not going to think right away. You're not going to think this is happening in outer space. You're not going to think that unless I say Michael Jordan in the movie Space Jam goes to outer space with space aliens and plays in an alternate reality, a game of basketball. He donks on the alien. He, you know, you're not thinking basketball in outer space. Are there analogies of basketball in outer space? Space Jam's one of them. But unless you specify that this is happening in outer space, you don't automatically assume that. I can't prove that it isn't in outer space. You can't prove that it is in outer space. Mm. You have to try and make a case. I see Paul, a man writing in the 50s, sandwiched between a man named Josephus and a man named Philo of Alexandria, both Jewish, both historians, writing about Jews being crucified by Romans. Romans had a fetish for crucifying Jews in the real world all the time. Mm -hmm. You get to Paul and you think outer space? No, you would immediately automatically assume Earth. You would need overwhelming contextual data to prove this is on outer space. So I am simply saying in Paul, when he says he was born of a woman, the word born can be mean made. And in this case, I think he does mean made because he thinks Jesus is incarnated. He has an incarnation. I think Paul may think that Jesus preexisted in some fashion or form. And he came to earth through a woman, Richard Carrier says. He was born of a woman, according to Paul, in outer space, in the third heaven, right there near the moon, I think it is. Uh, He might think above that. But the point is, is he thinks that Paul literally thinks Jesus came in the flesh for real because he says he was in the flesh. To me, if someone's born of a woman under the law, made to be put under the law, and we don't know him in the flesh any longer, as Paul says, to me, that just sounds like you would think in earthly terms before you would go to outer space. And until I have overwhelming evidence that this is happening in outer space, the the heavenly hypothesis does not work to me as much as just here's a guy, just like any other Caesar or important figure who ends up becoming deified. They made legend and mythology around him. That's the most plausible explanation to me. Mm -hmm. Mythicists that do bring in arguments really do have amazing insights, and you should consider the things that they say. There's some interesting stuff. However, There seems to be this dogmatic fundamentalism in the mindset of many mythicists online. Everything has to be about Jesus didn't exist. It's almost like some of them, when I hear them write, if Jesus did exist, then their whole life almost has to flash before their eyes and they almost have to believe in Jesus again or something. It it sounds like they're having, they're angry and they need it to be that he didn't exist. Dude, Mm. I don't know if he did exist, Lloyd. I'm telling you what I think. If he did or didn't, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. But I'm giving you honest, hardcore criticism of why I have drawn just on Paul, why I think there was a guy and what happened to him. Just like the Caesars, he became a myth. He became a legend. I, um, the way I, I mean, I've thought about it an awful lot, having listened to both sides. And I'm definitely, you know, there's there's still a lot that I I haven't perhaps considered, but um, I don't really feel like I need to take a position on it almost because it's you can like be agnostic, yeah, exactly. Exactly, it's like for me, it, it whether it was like you say a guy or whether um, Jesus isn't is completely a a fabrication. 
uh, makes no difference to me so long as yeah. the actual um, accounts of his life contradict each other, um, contain um, very immoral uh, ideas, um, and ultimately have, have been kind of bastardized to control people. Um, and and I think it's been I forget where, where who said it, but you know we know more about the writers of the Old Testament than we know about the New Testament. Um, the very fact that something that's supposed to be newer than the Hebrew Scriptures has is shrouded in in so much mystery, um, and ultimately the process of. Of, of a church deciding which books get to be canonical and which books don't. It just has human tinkering all over it. So mm-hmm. whether Jesus is is real or not almost becomes an irrelevant question. If that yeah, makes it sense. does become irrelevant yeah. in, in, in practice and in reality. Yeah. I mean, you got 2 billion people who believe him. If he didn't exist, this is what really attracted me initially to the mythicist thing. Yeah. If he did not historically exist at all, that is like almost the biggest practical joke I've ever heard played on human history. I mean, mm. the guy you all think is literally going to come back at some point in the future mm. on a cloud or somehow to end all human history didn't even exist. <laughs> mm. Like what? And that really was the most mind blowing thing. And he could have not existed. I still mm. say that, but I, in this case, I lean what makes the most sense to me. And if it, It's not the celestial model. So to give credit to some form of mythicism, one could argue, I just don't think it makes better sense, but one could argue that Paul and the earliest Christians believe Jesus existed sometime in the not too distant past, even if he didn't, on earth and was crucified on earth in the not too distant past. And he was mythologized from there. Or he, they had built on and built upon this this non-historical painted as if he was historical person Mm. so i don't take the heavenly model that makes the most sense to me i would imagine if if a mythicist model made more sense to me it would be here's this guy we say existed 30 years 40 years ago we can't prove that uh who who had these amazing teachings and whatnot and he's the one um that would make sense it doesn't make as much sense to me than there was a guy but the Doherty hypothesis, which is the one that Richard Carrier is espousing, to me doesn't make as much sense of the data. Hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm glad we had this conversation because it's something that um, you know it, it fascinates me that the kind of whole mythicism versus historicism, whatever it is, uh, debate. But again, I don't really have a horse in it, and I wondered where you where you were on it. Um, I, I think we'll we'll wrap up now, um, but I I would like to just kind of encourage my viewers to check out your channel one more time um because it really does drill more into these issues such as the whole mythicism debate and and like you say you're branching out into into other texts like the quran you're dealing with scientology etc so uh, there will be a link below in the description uh, but please do check out Myth Vision it's a fantastic show even has a couple of appearances from yours truly Um, but I wanted to end by asking you if you could speak to, let's say your former self, if you could, um, if if there's someone watching who was similarly impacted by religious fundamentalism and is on the fence as to whether to, uh, do objective research into the validity of their beliefs, uh, what would be your message to them? The first message I would tell them is to don't beat yourself up. Uh, it's okay not to be okay kind of thing. Um, I would I would just say you're a good person, no matter what your theology says, no matter what they tell you. Um, I would also try to tell them if it was me speaking to me, hey, I've dug, hell's not real. There is no fiery eternal conscious torment. That's a big pill to swallow for a lot of people to realize that that's mythology. And that's something that didn't even, the Jews didn't even have. Christians, you can find concepts of this in ancient Egypt and especially in Persia. So I would encourage them to not give up. If they're having serious troubles with this and it's hurting, 
believe, believe in something. Okay. Believe in something bigger than yourself. Believe in a God, um, maybe change how you understand it, whatever it is, take your time, land the airplane, because you can eventually come to where I'm at in a healing safe way where you don't have to crash and burn, mm -hmm. but just believe right now, believe what you need to believe. Maybe go seek counseling and professional help too, because that therapy will really be helpful for people who are going through this to talk it out with somebody. That would be my encouragement. And um, I would just say that at the end of the day, if you're hearing me and some of the things I say disturb or scare you, understand that I still love the Bible. I still love these stories. I still love all of this material. I love it for what it is, meaning these are ancient men who are writing clever stories um, writing sometimes history, sometimes ugly stuff. Uh, it's important that we know that because it's a fossil in our history as humans to where we've come ethically, to where we've come religiously, scientifically, all of it. It plays a part. We're standing on the backs of giants. So I look at it like an anthropologist might look at a fossil and go, this is a hominid that we transitioned. And look, this hominid looks like it was killed by an animal. That's ugly. Should I avoid it now? No, learn from it. Just like I would say, learn from the biblical stuff on what we may can do and should do and things we definitely shouldn't because there's plenty of those lessons in the Bible as well. Well said. I, I really love the land the airplane analogy because I think that the, there are many out there in sort of the quote unquote atheist community who just want you to kind of wake up one day as a Christian and then wake up the next day as an atheist. And it really isn't that simple, is it? It's a, it's a journey and you need to do it at your own pace. Uh, if you do it at all, you know, it, it, whatever works best for your mental health, I guess, is what you're, what you're saying. Final thing, you brought it up and it's important mm -hmm. I say this. If you find that atheism or some form of non-belief causes you nihilism, uh, that you literally lose meaning and purpose for some mm. reason. I don't know how I found purpose without it. There's sometimes I think deep about this and it is scary to think like, Ooh, there's nothing right. Or nothing's going to happen mm. when I die other than the memory I have here. Like, what is this? Um, then I would say, find a philosophy or a belief system that is not harmful, that helps you. Mm. If you're somebody who is living a religious life and it is harmful even just the beliefs in your mind are harmful to you. They're not good. I would recommend either not believing in that anymore and finding whatever does, even if it is not belief in any of this stuff anymore. I'm a humanist. I believe in humans. I believe that we together can do this. And so I have all the meaning and purpose I have, and I don't need to believe there's some ontological, metaphysical meaning and purpose in order to have purpose. Uh, I have it right now, right here, and um, I'm an example that it can be done. But if it doesn't work for you, find what does. Very, very well said. Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, having this conversation. Please keep up the excellent work, uh, and I will continue to enjoy the amazing videos you put out. So thank you. Thank you, brother. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I certainly have. Please do remember to subscribe for similar interviews. But for now, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching.